afternoon and welcome to Bible study with yours truly, Pastor Curtis Grant. And to all of you, the Zidano family, to those of you that have gathered with us today, it is such a wonderful day to be in the land of the dying on our way home to the land of the living. And I hope you have brought your Bibles uh, to this hour so that we can kind of uh, see where we are today. And we have a lot of dialogue that uh, Paul shares with the Corinthians uh, concerning the Macedonians. And so he's uh, in these uh, chapters bragging to the Corinthians about the Mas Macedonians willingness to give and how they out of their poverty had given to uh, this cause uh, because the church at Jerusalem, all right, was in need of support and help. <clears throat> and so uh, I I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading uh, uh, you know, eight, seven, the rest of seven is uh, eight. Uh, you can take time to do that because it's just a dialogue uh, in uh, that particular area. And so I want to just kind of fast forward so that we can see the principles uh, that are aligned for us here. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4 says, Praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saint. And he is basically uh, in these um, um, scriptures uh, bragging to the, Cor the Corinthians about the generosity of the Macedonians. And so when we finally get to um, verse uh, chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, then we start seeing uh, Paul talking about, for as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superficial for me to write to you, all right? For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to, to them at Macedonia and Achaia uh, was already a, a year ago, and your zeal has provoked very many, okay? And so uh, he wants to uh, encourage the Corinthians to let them know that uh, he had been bragging to the Macedonians uh, on them as well, and your gifts were already prepared, all right? And we want to stay focused on the gift, all right? Because you have to understand that it is the gift, it is the collecting of money, the gift that Paul is after from both the Corinthians church and the, the church at Macedonia. Because the church at uh, Jerusalem was in need. And uh, I want to take you back to uh, that particular instance so that you can begin to see what I'm talking about. And so if you go back with me to Acts chapter 4, and uh, we will look at uh, verse 34, I think it is, somewhere around in there. Uh, 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 um, and so I want you to see uh, what happened to the church at Corinth. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not, I mean, not at Corinth, but at um, uh, Jerusalem. All right. And so uh, we start at verse 34, Acts chapter 4, 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked, all right, for as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold, all right, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Josie, who by the apostle was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted, sons of con con son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. All right? And you have to see that uh, the, 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 the church at Jerusalem uh, began to sell all of their property, sell their houses, sell all of the stuff they had, and they all laid that at the apostles' feet. Because they were under the mindset uh, that Jesus was going to return in their generation. And so there was no need for earthly goods uh, because their mindset was that Jesus was going to return during their set time. And come to find out that after uh, uh, years had gone by, uh, that they found themselves in a tight situation because once you sell your house, once you sell your land, you have nothing to allow you to accu accumulate wealth. You don't have any value uh, because when you sell it, it belongs to somebody else. 
And so this is the situation that the church at Jerusalem had gotten themselves in. And so they were no longer able, all right, to pay tithes or to do anything because everybody sold what they had and they laid it at the apostles' feet. And the apostles distributed them, all right, uh, as people had need. But once the, 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 uh, the, the uh, uh, distributing uh, had ended, <clears throat> there was no other way to gather resources, all right, to continue to take on the needs of the church at uh, Jerusalem. And so this is why the, the gathering of the monies from the different churches at Corinth and at Macedonia and at the other churches was necessary because every church must begin to support the other church, all right? And so, I, I, first of all, I think we need to see the simple principle is that, you know, this is no competition. This is no uh, church competition. This is about uh, having God's presence on the earth in the kingdom of God, and we are not in competition one with the other. We should be, and I underline that with capital, uh, capital letters, we should be in support one of another, all right? If a church needs help, we should not have a problems with supporting or helping the church, but as you know, in the generation in which we live, that's not uh, the, 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 the idea that we have, all right? It seems like every person is to themselves and everybody got to survive on their own, but the Spirit of God would have us as a church to operate as one, all right? And so this is what God uh, wants us to really understand when it comes to uh, really uh, looking at the church at large, all right? And so now I'm going to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and uh, start there and begin to walk through uh, what Paul says for us, uh, touching the ministry to the saints at Jerusalem. It is superficial for me to write to you, for I know the formalness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them at Macedonia, uh, at, at Achaia, uh, was a year, uh, was ready a year ago, and your zeal has provoked very many. Yet have I uh, sent the brethren, lest at our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready, lest happy, um, if thou uh, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we that uh, that we say not ye should be ashamed in this confident uh, boasting. All right, and so he's just uh, basically saying to them they want the, you know uh, their boasting would be in vain if y'all ain't prepared when we get there so that we can get our money and move. All right, uh, and and the first thought I want you to understand is that while the church is taking up a collection, all right, for um, uh, the church at Jerusalem. You have to understand that this collection that's being taken is not going to stay at the church of Corinth. It is not going to stay at the church of uh, 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 Macedonia, all right? So the question now becomes, if the money they're gathering is sent to Jerusalem, then how is the church at Corinthian and the church at Macedonia taking care of their responsibilities? And I want to submit to you tithes and offering, all right? Because we have argued and fought, you know, about let every man give as he see purpose in his heart, all right? And he and you you miss the context because the context is talking about in this particular giving to the church at Corinthian because they had already paid their tithes because that's what makes their church function. That's what keeps their church afloat, afloat is their tithe, all right, and their offerings, all right? And now what Paul is talking about is an extra giving. It's a, a gift to the side to support some other church, all right? And this is where we are not clear on when it comes to understanding the scripture in chapter 9 because we just read what's in front of us and not and don't understand the history that is tied to the verbiage that we read. And so that's why I'm taking time to help you understand, uh, you know, this, this gathering of money was for the church at Jerusalem. All right? Verse 5 says, Therefore I thought it necessary to exalt the brethren that they would go before you and make up be, uh, beforehand your bounty or your gift. 
Wherefore ye have not ye had noticed uh, before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not of covetousness. All right, and he wants to say you want to understand uh, this is a this is not a matter of people just being greedy and they just want your money. This is a matter of trying to be a support to those who are in need. All right, and so that's what he does there. And then you follow it now in verse six. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth abundantly shall reap also bountifully. All right? Or as I say bountifully, shall also reap bountifully. All right? And so you got to understand he wants to help the people understand in the church the, the level in which you give is the level in which you will receive because every time you sow, there is a harvest that comes along with your sowing. And what you find out is that the, that the principles of God is based on, all right, reaping and sowing. It's the harvest, the reaping and the sowing. It's the same seed or the same principles as a farmer, okay? Uh, and God uses those principles because those are the kind of people that he was dealing with. He was dealing with people who were just everyday farmers, and he dealt in languages that they understood. And so that's why the kingdom of God is a lot established with reaping and sowing because Israel was an agricultural kind of nation they lived from the earth. They lived from the ground. They lived by cattle and the animals and all that kind of stuff. And so the principle of God dealing with the selection of the uh, uh, Jewish people, he had to deal with them in terms they understood. And so that's why the kingdom of God, when you look at it, is, 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 is always uh, manifesting itself in farming terms, all right, reaping and sowing harvest, you know, uh, that kind of stuff, because that's the language that God had to use in order to get the Israelites to understand the principles by which he was trying to convey. Now, when you move into this generation, we don't have, you know, fields and cows and things of that nature, but you have to understand that you have to divide the word uh, rightly, because in that time, it was fields and cows and, and harvest. But now in our time, since we don't have fields and cows, we have income. And so now that same principle applies to our income, all right? Because the house of God and the institute of God still has to be taken care of in this generation. It, you know, it's just the, the, the styles of living has changed, amen? And so at the end of the day, you see the switch. The principles don't change, but the elements do. All right. And so now you see that we all go to work. We get an income. All right. And it's out of the income that we should put, support the church and the institute that God uh, has established for us. And he says, when you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. All right. And when you sow uh, bountifully, you reap bountifully. Uh, verse seven says, every man according as he has purpose in his heart. So let him give not grudgingly nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And you have to understand why, why is it uh, that he would say not grudgingly, all right? Because when you look at the fact that they had to support their church with tithes and offering already, that suggests that we've already taken care of our responsibility for this church. Now you're asking us to go over and above our responsibility to help somebody else all right, and help some some other church. All right, and that's why he used it. If you do it grudgingly, then uh, it's not something that is going to be well pleasing in the Lord. Because the truth of it is, it could have been your church. All right, but it wasn't. And God has blessed you with the means to help somebody else. And you should never give to anything or anybody, especially in the church, grudgingly or you know with an attitude. Because God, the Bible says loves a cheerful giver, all right? Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work, all right? Because what people don't understand is that when we give, all right, uh, especially to the body of Christ, all right, we are giving in a twofold manner. 
All right, we're giving to meet the need that is before us, but it's also giving, all right, to uh, uh, a heavenly uh, account in heaven. Because when you give your hard-earned money to the church, when you give it to the people who are in need, uh, God account that in your uh, uh, heavenly account as something honorable and righteous. All right, and so you got two accounts. You got one on the earth and one in heaven. All right, the Bible talks about when you die and go to heaven, your work shall follow you. Well, it, it wants to submit that when you get there, your account is there. All right, it wants to it wants to submit that every time you do something in the realm, in the physical realm, to support the church, to bless the church, to bless somebody who is in need, it it doesn't only have a, a value when you do it. All right, it has eternal value because God accounted in your account in heaven as righteousness. Uh, and let me see if I can make sense because, you know, sometimes when you talk, you know, people don't understand. And so I'd rather see if I can kind of put it in a, in a manner that will make sense to you. So let me look at Matthew chapter 6. And uh, I think it's around, I'll find it in a minute. Uh, um, let me see. 19, okay? Uh, Matthew 6, 19. All right? So what he says here in 6, 19, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, all right, where moth and rust do corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Watch what he says. He says, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. All right? Well, how do you do that? Well, you do that by using your money, the Bible calls it unrighteous mammon, all right, to help somebody else to support the church. Because when you do that, all right, it meets an immediate need, and then it also meets uh, 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 an account that is in heaven because God imputes it into your account of uh, the righteousness and your heart's desire to be a help to those of us uh, that are in need on earth. Amen? And so he says... Uh, but lay up for yourself the treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust new, uh, do corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. All right? And so at that, the end of that uh, uh, Matthew piece, he wants to submit that when you really get a glimpse of what your giving does, then you give more freely knowing that giving on earth does not just stay on earth. It also follows you in your account in heaven, all right? And so uh, it also shows and reveals where your heart is because God wants you to understand that uh, we as the believers have to support uh, the institute in which he has ordained for us that we might be able to survive in the earth, all right? And so uh, I want you to see um, as we go to verse 9, as it is written, we're in 2 Corinthians verse 9, uh, verse 9, chapter 9, as it is written, he that has dispensed abroad is he that's given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. All right? And that's the point when you give, God imputes it into your account. All right? And that is the part of righteousness that remains forever because when you die and go to heaven, your works follow you. All right? When you get there, your works waiting on you. All right, because everything we do in terms of sowing and reaping, reaping and sowing, all right, God keeps account of it. All right, everything that leaves our hand, all right, never leaves our lives. All right, because once we get to heaven, all right, God has an account of everything we do. Amen. And so uh, it ain't, you know, and my dad, uh, Bishop Van, always says it ain't about the pie in the sky until like when I die. It's about having some uh, sound uh, while I'm still around, some sound while I'm still around, I think he says. Uh, and so it ain't just going to benefit you when you get to heaven. It's going to bless you while you're here, all right? Because the scripture says, given it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it shall men give unto your bosom. And so you can't lose with giving, all right? And so you have to understand that God uses this uh, giving uh, uh, um, uh, uh, precept and principle to try to develop in the believers a giving spirit because what folks don't understand is that it is literally impossible 
for you to be stingy in one area and not be stingy across the board, all right? And so what God does is he tries to use our money, the thing that is most important to us, to teach us how to give so that we can have a giving spirit because love don't work unless you are in the posture of giving, all right? And if the greatest command is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, you can't do that unless you're willing to give. Love thy neighbor as thyself. You can't do that unless you're willing to give because love is always in the posture of giving, all right? And so when you look at God, God is love, the Bible says. And what if God stopped giving, all right? The world will stop spinning. The sun will stop shining. The stars will stop fall from their series, series, silvery sockets. That's what happens when you got big lips, girl. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, it would just, it, things would just stop functioning because God, all right, he is love, and love is always in the posture of giving. Even when we don't do right, and even when we don't do what we're supposed to do, God cannot be untrue to his own character. He still blesses. He still gives because it's just who he is, all right? And so we have to suffer the consequences of our decision, but the truth of it is, God all right, is always in the posture of giving. And he's trying to teach his children to have that same posture because when you give, all right, your give is not going unnoticed. God knows every dime you have given, all right? And even though the people have not given it back, God has blessed you from other folks, all right, that you wasn't even thinking about giving to, and God has put it back in your hands simply because you gave it, all right? And the problem is you so focused on uh, the person you gave it to, and you're stuck on the fact that they haven't gave it back to you, that you've missed the fact that God gave it back to you from some other means, all right? And you have not missed a lick at your giving because even though the person that you gave it to didn't give it back to you, God found a way to give it back to you plus some. And because you're stuck in one frame of mind, you have become bitter because you've allowed that one person to upset you because they went on a cruise and they owed you some, some money and they paid you back. They drive a new car, they paid you back. And you done got bitter because of that. And you're not looking at the fact that in spite of the fact that they hadn't paid you back, God has blessed you over and over and over again. He sent it through the back door. You hit the front door, all right? And so at the end of the day, I want you to consider that because some people have lost valuable relationships over money, all right? Lost their sisters and brothers over money, over money, 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 Jesus. We have lost valuable relationships over money, all right? And saints, let me tell you something. At the end of the day, your money can only take you so far, but your friendships are more valuable than your money will ever be able to establish. And so I'm hoping somebody listening to me because there's some folks on the other end of this lien has fallen out with some folks over money. But I dare you to look at your life and, and, and I want you to, uh, here's what I want you I want you to look at the money that you gave and the money you're angry over and then look back at your life and see how much money has come through the back door that, that over succeeded what you had gave to the people that you're mad at. Because what you'll see is, is that in spite of the fact that you have lost friends over a couple of dollars, all right, God has blessed you over and over again, and you still hold it on to what you should have let go of, all right? Let me move on, because I'm hoping I'm helping somebody, because uh, money is a, is a dangerous thing. Uh, the, the OJs had that song, money, 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 money. And some people got to have it. Hey, 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 some people really need it. Ah, oh, listen to me, y'all. Do things, do things, do things, bad things with it. Doom, doom, doom. Y'all know it. I know y'all over there. Y'all over there popping. Yeah, I know it. Okay? But I'm just saying, when you listen to the song, man, it is so, it is so filled with truth and principle because money will drive people crazy. All right, and it's doing that even in our generation where we have switched money for the, 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 the precious gift of friendship and loved ones and family members. We have switched the most precious things 
just for the dollar bill, all right? And I think we've made a big mistake because at the end of the day, as my mother-in-law said before she passed, she said, son, remember, I don't care how much money you have, the greatest thing you're going to ever have in your life is people and friendship. She said to me, your dollar can't bring you a drink of water when you're sick, all right? But your friends can. And I will never forget that because it's a wisdom that now I understand in a, in a plethora of ways because at the end of the day, you know, when you talk about people, they are the most valuable thing outside of Jesus that you have in your entire life. And I told uh, one of, uh, of my, uh, my sons, I was, I was talking to him, I said, man, you don't have to have a whole lot of money in the bank. What you have to have is friends that have money in the bank. Because if you are true, and if you are faithful, and if you are kind, all right, then people who love you don't mind giving to you what they have. All right? And as long as you're responsible and take care of it, you're just as rich as they are. All right? Because when you got access to stuff, that means you ain't got to pay the bill, you ain't got to pay the insurance, but you got access to it. You can use it when you get ready. All right? And the point I'm trying to get to you is this. You are just as rich as you have ever been, not because you got a lot of money, but because when you got friends that are true, when you got faithful people who love you and you love them back honestly, all right? There's a whole lot of things that you have access to that you didn't pay one dime for, all right? And that's because of the friendship and the love that you have with people, all right? And we, you know, the devil got us fighting because he knows that when he, when he gets us divided, it's the, it's the divide and conquer kind of syndrome. Because when you got people fighting over, you know, uh, what, uh, 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 we got people fighting over, you know, the uh, 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 the president. We got people fighting over what 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 uh, denomination you are. Uh, I'm Baptist. You Pentecostal. You, we listen. If we believe in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what's on the on the title on the door. All right, because Jesus says when you're baptized in the body of Christ, we all become one. All right, and we fighting over whether we're Pentecostal or Baptist or uh, Pentecostal. I mean, all them, we fight over stupid stuff. Whether we baptize in the name of Jesus, baptize in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, baptism don't save you no way. All right? We fight over dumb, somebody shout dumb stuff. Because the devil knows that if we ever come together, we're going to be a force to be reckoned with in the earth. All right? And so he keeps us fighting over dumb stuff because at the end of the day, y'all, we are better together than we are apart. Okay, and so uh, I want to try to read this. Uh, verse 10 says, Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruit of your righteousness. All right? Now he that ministereth seed. Who, do, who ministereth seed? God does. All right? And he ministered, all right, to the sower, all right? Now, I want you to see the connection because most people don't get it most of the time. Because if you ain't sowing, there is no need for your seed, okay? And so the principle is, why would I put seeds in a hand that don't sow? Because the seed is going to get stuck in a position that is not going to become useful. All right, because the seed only become useful when you sow it in the ground. You see, and most of us are broke right now today because we don't know how to sow. All right, seeds in your hands don't do nothing, but seeds that are sown brings back a harvest that you have to get people to help you. All right, get the harvest that the seed has sown. All right, the seed not only brings back a harvest, but it produces. The, the elements that make bread, all right? So you ain't got to go hungry when you are sowing, all right? And the God of your salvation is giving you seed to sow, and the more you sow, the more seed he gives, all right? Because at the end of the day, if you are not going to sow, then what's the purpose of giving you the seed, all right? And so I'm hoping I'm making sense to somebody today, all right? He says, uh, now he that uh, ministereth, ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and 
multiply your seed sown. See that? Okay? Because if you keep sowing, you keep giving, he has to keep putting it back in your pocket in order for you to keep giving. Because if you don't get it back, then you run out, right? And so the power, the power of sowing and reaping is the fact that the more you give, the Bible says you can't be God giving, right? So if you keep giving, all right, he has to restore you in order for you to keep giving. God needs you to keep giving because the hands that give are those that supply those who are in need. Okay? And so, uh, at the end of the day, you have to understand the power of the principle, all right? And, and, and he says, he, the, uh, verse 10 says, both minister bread for you, and then it multiply your seed sown, all right? And increase the fruit of your righteousness. Because every time you give, and every time you bless somebody, every time you support the church, Every time you support the pastor, every time you sow into the pastor's life, you have to understand that it don't just bless you while you're on earth. God has an account in heaven that every time you express the righteousness, and that word righteousness means to be in alignment with Christ or the alignment with God, and seeing that God is always in the posture of giving. When you give, you look like God because you're in alignment with God because if God was here, that's what he would do. He would give those individuals what they needed because he promised that if you sow, then I will provide your needs accordingly, all right? And so when you meet the needs of people, you are literally uh, 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 reflecting uh, the, the response and the glory of God, all right? And you don't understand that any time you take up God's agenda, he will bless you because he can't find too many people that's willing to submit themselves to his agenda. Because the more people he has doing his agenda, the more people he can bless and get them where they really need to be. All right? And so, it uh, looked like my time has run out. Uh, it just seemed like it was real short today. Uh, and so, uh, we will uh, talk about uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11, the next time the Lord give us the privilege to come together. But read it, saints. You don't have to trust nothing I tell you. Read the Bible. Uh, because I, I want people to read it uh, because I want you to see what the scripture is saying because once you read it and understand it then you don't ever have to trust nobody else but God alright so if there's any one of you that want to give your life to the Lord today alright today is a good time to sow your life into the kingdom of God and I guarantee you if you sow your life into the kingdom of God I promise you it will be a harvest that you will never 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 forget and it is a harvest, it is, it'll be a harvest that you never dreamed that you would have. And so today, if you want to sow your life to the Lord, today is a good day. Uh, ZionHopeMBC.org slash visit. Uh, give us your name and all that information that's there. And we will get back with you as soon as possible so that we can direct you to a place where you can get what you need uh, in order for you to grow so that God be glorified. And don't forget, every day at 1 o'clock we are praying, all right? Uh, man, the Bible says, Luke said, man should always pray. And I say, if you're praying, you're not fainting. And if you're fainting, it may be because you're not praying. And so at the end of the day, pray 1 o'clock every day so that we can continue to uh, pray for those who are uh, much needed. All right? Uh, our prayers. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the presentation that has been given today. We ask now that you take the feeble words that have proceeded out of my mouth, make them understandable for the minds who have gathered at this coming. I pray, God, that you would touch our spirit in a manner that we might be able to digest these principles and really believe what you're trying to help us see so that we, as the people of God, will begin to trust the very things that you have already put before us. I pray now that you cover us with your blood, cover us with your blood, cover us with your blood. Because it's so much craziness going on out here. And Lord, we just need you to cover us. Cover us now. And we'll be careful to give you praise, Lord, and honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God.